Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The only information we've had up until this study was uh, sightings information where the Texas Parks and Wildlife would track documented sightings where people have seen bears and they report them. The bat flights are pretty spectacular. 500,000 bats here at the cave. There's the green environmental side and then the green money side. And it's great we're able to benefit from doing something environmentally friendly. There were times when I wasn't sure it was going to work. We were all going to have to just walk away and turn it into a battle where the lawyers could make a lot of money. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Chevrolet bringing you closer to your love of the outdoors because there's life to be done. The black bear is making a return to East Texas, an animal that was almost wiped out due to unregulated hunting and loss of habitat is slowly making its way back to the bottomland forests along the state's eastern border. The bears are coming. The adjoining states of Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana have a growing, expanding bear population, and they're spilling over into East Texas and will continue to do so. It's a pretty nice looking bottomland through here. So now, a team from Stephen F. Austin State University is looking for black bears. We really have uh, limited information about how many bears we have in Texas and where they are. Yeah, this looks like really good habitat. The only information we've had up until this study was uh, sightings information where the Texas Parks and Wildlife would track uh, documented sightings where people had seen bears and they report them. He comes through generally April and May. More and more East Texans are seeing black bears. Here, so we should be able to get a picture of him. Landowners' remote cameras provide the proof that bears are here. Now this shows the bear laying. He's really controlling the corn that I have. Yeah, it almost out. looks like that's early morning and he fell asleep in that corn pile to me. Parks and Wildlife started keeping data on black bear sightings in East Texas about 1978. Since that time, we've had about 120, give or take, black bear sightings, and probably 80% or more of those have been in the last 10 to 20 years. Right now, we're gonna go up into this area. Graduate student Dan Kaminsky yeah, like goes go over the search area this for this massive one. bear study. I wanna get in there and put in this site today. Dan and his team will spend three years searching the Natchez and Sabine River basins of southeast Texas. Hey, this area's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's actually uh, right up here. We're primarily interested in large, contiguous, undeveloped habitats, uh, large chunks of forest. We might be able to find a good spot up here. We're kind of focusing in on areas where we've had a lot of historic sightings of black bears over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. To identify possible bears, the team is using barbed wire as part of a new DNA sampling technique. I'll hold it. It's called a hair snare trap. A hair snare trap is an array of barbed wire strung around three or four trees. Down a little bit. And an animal actually has to cross through the barbed wire to get to the bait, hopefully leaving uh, hair samples on the barbs. That looks good. And the bait of choice? It's USDA Prime cow blood. That's a ripe one. Uh, the lure we use is a three to one mixture of cattle, uh, cattle blood and fish oil. Uh, we let it age for about four months and then uh, bottle it up into individual one liter bottles. 100% guaranteed maggot free. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The idea is you want something that really smells a lot. It's going to project an odor over a long distance. Okay. There you go. Perfect. And for dessert, 
cherry pie filling. We're also trying to appeal to their, their sweet tooth, essentially. No matter what kind of, what their preference is, they're gonna find something that wants to bring them in here. Well, I think that spot might turn out pretty well. Hopefully we'll get something. I mean, we should be able to get a lot of hair samples in this bottom land anyway. In Montana, researchers have mounted remote video cameras to study grizzly and black bears using the same hair snare traps. So when bears get to the hair traps, they either have to go over or under the barbed wire uh, and as they pass, hopefully leave hair on the wires. And some of the bears, when they come into these piles, they'll roll in the blood and, and it's just kind of, uh, you know, kind of like a dog would roll in a dead animal. Bear rubs are also good spots to capture not only bear behavior, but bear DNA as well. So as bears travel through their home range, they'll use these natural rub objects as an indication to other bears to say, hey, I'm in this area. And so what the researchers in Montana have done is that they've actually put barbed wire on these natural rub objects so when bears rub on them, they can collect genetic material through the hair, through the hair follicle for uh, DNA testing. Back in the forests of East Texas, Dan's team continues to check the snare sites, and they're finding some hair. Yeah, how's it look? I think this one's a hog looking at the medulla. Dan has hundreds of samples to analyze. Based on the cuticular structure or the scaling on the hair, uh, I can use this dichotomous key to help identify if we have a raccoon or a hog or even a bear hair sample here. Is hog what you see mostly? It's been primarily hog and raccoon. Intense logging of bottomland hardwood forests in the late 1800s wiped out most of the black bear habitat in Texas. There has been a great loss, and reclamation is, is a, uh, a mechanism to, to regain what we once had. J.W. Smith lives up along the Texas-Oklahoma border and has seen black bears on his property. And the pecan crops, what brought the bear into here? Yeah, I would assume. It's... He's working with Texas Parks and Wildlife to restore some of the savannas. Bottomland hardwood forest habitat that used to be here. Eastern red cedar, though it's native, it's really taken over. So, in order to restore that diverse forest savanna that should be here, first of all, you have to remove those cedars so that those other things can return. So, you basically go from 500 to 600 acres of poor habitat. Yeah, to a quality to, habitat. Yeah, it's a fantastic habitat. Yeah, this recovers and does well. We're right now in Pecan Bayou in northeast Texas. Pecan Bayou runs parallel to the Red River, and it's a high-quality habitat corridor. So any habitat work being done adjacent to this provides connectivity for these bears to, to move through these corridors. Maybe we can set it as an example. I guess I really am glad to see that the bears are coming back, and I hope that what we do in conservation and, and habitat restoration will, will help that. It's been three years now, and Dan's team has covered thousands and thousands of acres. The most important part right now is just making sure that we get all the hair collected before we do anything else. The hair snare team found hundreds and hundreds of samples. When I come across these hair samples that I'm not sure what they are, it's usually because they're under fur. It turns out no samples proved to be bear hair. But one thing Dan's learned on this study, the habitat is here and the black bear is coming back to these remote parts of East Texas. If we don't have bears here in East Texas right now, that's okay, uh, but we know that the habitat exists for them. Uh, it's just a matter of time before they actually do establish a, a, a self-sustaining breeding population.
we know that this is going to take a while and if we will just give them a chance and try and learn to live with them and not harm them, I think people will be pleasantly surprised at the opportunity to see them and to live with them again in the forests of East Texas. There are few places left that have not been largely touched by our culture. But at Kickapoo Caverns State Park, nature is almost untouched, the way it used to be. It's a great place to just get away from it all. You can unplug from all the distractions in the city. We've got approximately 6,400 acres and, and, and lots to do. We've got birding, hiking, mountain biking. Um, it's just a great place to get away from it all and just get back in, in touch with nature. See the scrub jays? Much of the beauty of Texas is hidden. To see it, you have to work for it, sometimes catching only a fleeting glimpse. Over 230 species of birds have been seen in this park. We get a lot of birders from all over the country. They've read about it. We've got a lot of diversity here, and they're here a lot of times to fill their life list, whether they're looking for the black cap vireo or the uh, Golden Cheek Warbler, we've got them both here, so it's a great place for birding. Jessica Klassen is a graduate student at Texas A&M University, studying the endangered Golden Cheek Warbler. Right, here is one of our Golden Cheek Warbler nests. Uh, they make their nests out of the strips of ash juniper bark. So the little clump up there of ash juniper that you see at the canopy of the tree um, is our Golden Cheek Warbler nest, and directly below it is you'll see our camera that we're using to monitor the nest with. Um, but we like to disturb them as little as possible, so we stay at the nest site for as short a period as possible. By using an infrared camera and remote recording unit, Jessica is able to monitor the bird nest without disturbing it. We've been seeing nestling type behavior, so we've seen both males and females carrying food, um, which we can infer would be to hungry nestlings in the nest. Enter the darkness of the subterranean wonder of Kickapoo Cavern and witness roughly four million years of nature's artistic handiwork. If y'all see this formation, pretty cool. This is what you call being deep in the heart of Texas. You got twin columns. One column on your right is the largest column in the state of Texas. It's 80 feet high, which is a little over eight stories. You can see the different colored drapery off of it, all the jellyfish looking stuff. I see Mother Nature at its best. The intrigue of the park lies as much above the ground as below. Stewart Bat Cave teams with Mexican free tailed bats. The bat flights are pretty spectacular. They are 500,000 bats here at the cave. It takes approximately an hour and a half for all the bats to get out of the cave. In our ever-expanding, fast-paced world, it's wonderful to know a place like Kickapoo Cavern State Park exists. It's a really beautiful place, and we're trying to keep it that way. We're trying to keep it as natural as possible. It's a, it's a great place to just get away from it all and enjoy a, a part of Texas a lot of people have never seen. Andy Chamberlain. Well, if y'all need something. Just lives and breathes her job. Give us a holler. So the plan is we start at Andy's the greenest person inside and outside the workplace I've ever known. Don't mess with Texas, people. <laughs> She's a ball of fire. <laughs> We're uh, working on our Adopt-A-Road project at McKinney Falls Parkway. We have a really good turnout. Her enthusiasm and her passion for the job right. is real infectious. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh. Yeehaw! Possibly a contact? Do you want to take this on? I look for ways to save the agency energy and money through yeah. utility conservation, mostly through energy efficiency. There's the green environmental side and then the green money side. Um, and it's great we're able to benefit from doing something environmentally friendly. One of her big accomplishments early on was to apply for solar grants, and we got almost $4 million in funds to put solar panels up at 18 parks, including the Austin headquarters. 
and at headquarters, the savings will be about $10,000 a year. She uh, found a grant that got the agency $64,000 to help purchase uh, 14 hybrid vehicles. Have a safe trip out. Thank you very All right, much. Thank you. I'd say we're uh, a leader in that regard. If she gets her mindset that this is something that's good for the agency or that's good to do, she'll persevere and, and see that it gets done. So we'll do the regular capital sort of way, right? I work with her with a bike to work program and she's definitely been enthusiastic and getting people aboard and excited about it. <laughs> we thought that the number one reason people weren't biking is because they didn't know a, a safe route. There's the capital, it's where all the magic happens. <laughs> we decided to start a group that people could ride to work with. Having coffee before we have to go up all the hills. And so Andy was critical in getting it started, getting the word out through the green team and getting people on board. Woohoo! There's never a dull moment when she's around. All right, guys. Crowd in. She's very bright, uh, energetic, positive thinking. Uno, dos, tres. Say cheese. Can't say enough about her. Well, she's very good at what she does and uh, very innovative. Her uh, enthusiasm and creativity come through and that's really good for Parks and Wildlife. Back in the early 1990s, a series of events took place that would lead to the largest cleanup of hazardous waste in Texas history. It was nothing short of a shotgun wedding between Alcoa and five government agencies, forced to work together to fix a serious problem. And in the beginning, no one had any idea how things would turn out. Our story starts in Lavaca Bay. The year is 1993. Port Lavaca, Texas has long been the home of both fishing and chemical industries. In the late 60s and early 70s, the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa, dumped as much as 67 pounds of mercury a day into Lavaca Bay, contaminating what was once a public food source. The health department closed portions of the bay in 1988 for fin fishing and shell fishing. And the information that we have from the health department is that one heavy meal for a pregnant woman could cause birth defects. Uh, oh, no, they didn't know. I, I don't think they knew. So he wants to put in just... Raynell Silcox is a Parks and Wildlife attorney. She worked on the case throughout the 1990s. I don't think they knew that mercury bioaccumulates, you know, that it doesn't go away, that it never goes away. It just keeps accumulating in your body. Yeah, the levels that, w that we found in Lavaca Bay were the highest we've seen anywhere within the state, even to this day. Kirk Wiles is an investigator with the Texas Department of State Health Services. In those early days, there really was not a lot of information out on mercury contamination in seafood. It was a hotly debated issue. The Texas Department of Health has closed this area because of the mercury contamination from, from Alcoa aluminum plant. I believe in good sound scientific data and the data tends to indicate there is a problem and this is why the health department did close down this area to fishing. All right, those years. The stakes are high in Port Lavaca and throughout the state. Texas residents face difficult dilemmas. I have three children. I have one boy that's 13, I have one boy that's 11, and then I have a little girl that's seven. It bothers me greatly that because I chose to live here and, and the lifestyle that I have may be affecting my children now, and, and that bothers me a great deal. We've got to conserve energy and natural resources today. We can't wait for tomorrow. When I first began in 1975, trying to deal with the issue of fish contamination in Lavaca Bay, industries in the area were in probably a state of denial. But vast improvements in the field of toxicology meant that industry could no longer ignore how pollutants impacted the environment. 
and increased public awareness created pressure on companies to act more responsibly. Meanwhile, nothing was being done to clean up the bay. We had a large portion of Lavaca Bay that was closed to uh, any consumption of fish. And uh, where do we start? Ken Rice is the Natural Resource Damage Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We've been working on this project for over 15 years. And the turning point came about when this particular site was declared a Superfund site in 1994. The cleanup of Lavaca Bay was shaping up to be complicated and expensive. And the legal logistics overwhelming. Three state agencies, two federal agencies, and Alcoa, as many as 50 people at the negotiating table. Um, yes, in the beginning it was um, pretty difficult. Arguing and hashing things out. Adversarial. Walking away from the table. Acrimonious. Coming back to the table. Well, something had to be done. I don't know what exactly happened to change that, but um, there w I, well, I think part of it was Ron Waddell. There were times when I wasn't sure it was going to work. I was afraid that we were all going to have to just walk away and call it quits and turn it into a battle where the lawyers could make a lot of money. About the time Ron Waddell got involved, the people at Alcoa did something unexpected. They owned up to the problem and vowed to clean up the bay. Alcoa can't wait. Because we are an old, old company, we have a lot of legacy projects. And what I mean by that is when these plants operate in the 40s and the 50s and even the 60s, there were no regulatory restrictions on what needed to be done. And in fact, the whole art of toxicology was poorly, poorly understood. In the early 1990s, we'd come to the realization that we were gonna have a lot that we would need to do. The negotiators used a new approach called habitat equivalency analysis, in which environmental damage is compensated through habitat replacement projects. It was a breakthrough. It was a huge breakthrough. You know, when you start talking about money, especially when you're dealing with corporations, that's when everybody gets nervous and upset. So if we leave it um, just discussing acreage and projects, people get, they start to get excited. $130 million is probably a good estimate. Nobody ever gave me a blank checkbook, but they always gave me a big checkbook, as long as I was doing the right thing with the money. When a corporation can put their name on a beautiful project, like a marsh or the piers and docks that they built, and have their name connected with something positive like that that's helped people, then I think that's good for them and it's good for the community. And Once there's buy-in by the company and they're involved in the restoration and they see what we're trying to do, that's when they learn to appreciate the environment. Take Port Lavaca for instance. It is an industry town. These people are dependent on jobs. However, they want quality of life as well. They want clean air, clean water. And this is a model for any area that works with industry. Most people would probably say that today, compared to 20 or 30 years ago, our water is cleaner and our air is cleaner. But that doesn't mean that you can stop. I mean, that doesn't mean it's anywhere near clean enough or, I mean, obviously it's not. We still have problems. But from now on, environmental negotiation may get a lot less contentious. What started out in 1993 as a shotgun wedding between industry and government has slowly matured into a bona fide marriage, for better or for worse, through good times and bad.
Oh, the cat's gonna try to move in. He's thinking about it. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Chevrolet, bringing you closer to your love of the outdoors, because there's life to be done.